John, I got a question to ask you. What is your definition of success? I, I began to ask myself, what is success to me? And I came up with this definition that really works for me. And that is success is having the people who know me the best, love and respect me the most. I think that's success. Uh, because, you know, I, I write books, but I could fake it out there, I guess. I, I speak to, on platforms to a lot of people. I guess I could fake it there. But you can't fake it at home. You can't, you can't fake it with your children. You can't, you can't fake it with the people who really know you. And when the people who know you the best love and respect you the most, I think that's a major statement about who you are, what your character is, and uh, you can go back on that kind of a person. So that became my definition of success, still is. Uh, so for what is it, maybe, you know, almost 40 years, that's just kind of how I, I mean, I think we go after uh, the, the what we would call recognition of success and, and don't understand that the core of success again is, is I think based on values and, and who you are as a, as a person. John Maxwell famously said, everything rises and falls on leadership. When life is bringing smooth seas, this is an easy statement to forget. However, when you're facing a storm in your life, this statement takes on incredible gravity and truth. Everything rises and falls on leadership. As I look at the state of the world over the past several years, division, COVID, social media, politics, the war in Ukraine, and a radically challenging business environment. Well, we've all experienced waves of uncertainty, ups and downs, and it's leaving all of us just a bit seasick. Why do we feel like, well, we're rudderless? My observation, poor or absent leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Realizing this truth, we didn't want to just complain. No, at Supreme instead, we wanted to invest in our own leadership this year. And so we created the Supreme Leadership Series to do just that. Along with other world-renowned leaders, we've conducted four sessions this year with the world's foremost expert on the topic of leadership, John Maxwell. For today's program, we'll be sharing with you a small sampling of the incredible wisdom that John has offered all of us on the most important topic of all, leading yourself and others to best. John Maxwell, welcome to Personal and Professional Best. How do you process making choices? There's a process to everything that's a best there is. idea. And so tell me your process. Well, first of all, John Wooden, I had him as a mentor the last 14 years of his life. And it, it, and it was life changing. Wow. Was life changing. And John Wooden taught me this. There is a choice you have to make in everything you do. So always remember that in the end, the choice you make makes you. And that was just powerful. And I just said, wow, coach. And I, and I memorized that quote and, and I, I, just, I just really lived by it. And, and uh, we are the sum total of our choices. What, what, what I am today um, is based upon the choices that I made. And, and I make my, uh, let, I wanna say a couple things about, first of all, choices. Uh, I make my choices based on my values. Um, I think decision making is quite easy if you know what your values are. Mm -hmm. I think decision making is very difficult if you don't know what your values are. Ed Bastian, who's the CEO of Delta, he and I are playing golf right, right in the year of COVID, but maybe, I don't know, August of that year. And so we're talking about values and, and, and how that helps with decision making and how that's your, that's your foundation. 
And, and, and the whole fact that if you know what your values are, decision-making is quite easy. If you don't know what your values are, decision-making gets very difficult. Choices are not easy at all. And, and he said, John, he said, what's interesting is, is, he said, during COVID, people that didn't have values before COVID found it to be a very difficult time for them. Mm. But if you have values going in, if you have values going into this incredible testing, trying time, again, it's an anchor. We've talked about it. And, and I know you, I know that's, that's true with you. So first of all, my choices are made pretty much on, on what my values are. Now, because I'm a leader, timing has a lot to do with choices. That's, that's not a value. So there are other things. But, but basically, I think consistency comes from knowing who you are and what your values are. And then all your decision making makes sense to the people around you. Because they say, well, that's John. That's, 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 how, that's who he is. That's, that's what his values are. But Here's what I think. I think decision making is overrated, and I think decision managing is underrated. I've made hundreds of decisions that weren't good decisions, not on purpose, but I mean, I, mean, sure. I just have a degree of stupid in me. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's it's almost like a spiritual gift in my life. Okay, <laughs> so. So, but I, and, and, I, and if somebody would come to me and say, well, no, I've always made good choices, we know that they're delusional. But I mean, I've made, a lot of, I've made a lot of choices that were the best choices. But what happens is when you find out, well, that was, I, that was not a good choice, then what you do is you adjust it. You say, well, you, immediately. Now, here's what I think. I, I think it's the management of the choices and the decisions that create greatness in people. And I, because the choices can be done in a, in a day, you can make a decision in a day, but then you have to manage that decision, Pat. And, and when I see people, they say, well, that decision made me or that choice made me. I want to look up and say, no, that choice puts you on a, on a path. But you manage that choice. The only way you stay on that road is you every day. You have to, you have to fight for your decisions. You have to manage those decisions. You have to understand that, that uh, when the mood is no longer what the mood was when I made the decision, it still was a right decision and I have to do it. And I think that we, I think we spend too much time on choice making and not enough on choice managing. I mean, when you get married, I mean, it's, of course everybody's good, happy on that day, you know, and, you know, yeah, <laughs> till death do us part and all that stuff happens. But then all of a sudden you go to life and all of a sudden you, you've got a death or a, 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 a difficulty. And, and then all of a sudden, it's not what I said, it's, it's, it's do I manage what I said. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. In the simplest terms, what is leadership? Well, leadership is influence. That's what I teach in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And the reason I use that as a definition is when I started teaching leadership now a long time ago, I mean, I was really starting 50 years ago teaching leadership. Uh, people thought leadership was position. They thought it was title. They, in other words, they thought it was a noun in, when it's really a verb. It's, it's, not, it's not who you are, it's what you do. And uh, that's why there are many people who never have like major leadership positions, but they're terrific leaders. And uh, in fact, if you'd even go back to the last century, uh, arguably maybe the, maybe the most influential leader in the whole world was Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she was a, a nun in a small order and, Calcutta, India. I mean, she, she didn't have a, like a, a title or a position or a, a place of leadership, but she was one. So leadership is influence, the ability to touch and influence people. Now, I have to qualify that just for a moment, Pat, because today in our social environment that we have with, with so so much social media, uh, people are, are, you know, do you like me? Do you not like me? And they're throwing all this stuff out. And, and, and there'd be a tendency when you think of leadership of influence, if somebody said, well, I had X amount of people follow me. Uh, I, I, would, I would say there's a difference between that influence. That's entertainment influence. Uh, that is, a, you know, leaders have purpose. Leaders going somewhere, they uh, have a, a, an intentionality about them to go and help people go from one point to another. So they influence people in the area of, of purpose and, um, and, and, and values. The first question I'd ask is, what are you doing to develop yourself? And the second question is, what are you doing to develop others? 
And the first question has to be first, because if you don't develop yourself, you have no capacity to develop. You cannot give what you do not have. So, so to me, develop myself so that I can develop you. And, and that's the reason. But in, in leadership, the great leaders, 90% of all leaders never reproduce other leaders. They just have followers. Most leaders never reproduce leaders. They just have followers. But the great leaders reproduce other leaders. And, and, that's, and that is extremely intentional. If you're on my team, I'm going to be very quick to find out what your gifts are, what your strengths are, what your passion is, what your temperament is. I'm going to, I'm going to ask myself about 11 questions with you so that I know, because I've got to find you before I can lead you. And the big miss is we try to lead people. We've not even found them yet. I mean, we found them. They're on, they're, they're in our department, but we, 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 we have, so we know where they are, but we don't know who they are. And, and, and a leader, you know, leaders have to lead people individually based upon who they are. They, managers lead everybody the same. Leaders lead everybody differently. So I'd find out who you are, what your passion is. I would find out all those things. And then I would, then I would ask you, I'd say, now, what's the best way for me to lead you? You know, I mean, different people need different leadership styles. What's the best way for me? And I would, see, I, see, I'm asking all these questions. I'm asking all these questions because one of the things I learned as a leader is the quickest way to give ownership to someone else is not give them answers, but ask them questions. Because the moment you tell me what the best way to lead you and I lead you that way, now the responsibility is on you to develop and follow. Too quickly, we want to carry the people. instead. And so in empowerment and equipping, I find you by asking these questions, this whole process. And then I go into the equipping, empowering process of which I do it, I do it, you're with me, you do it, and I'm with you, which is the coaching. And then you do it, which now we start empowering, and then you do it, and others are with you. And the, what, the reason we've developed so many leaders, and what's really helped us be effective, is the magic in step five. If I was developing you, before I poured myself into you, the question I'd ask you is, now who are you going to develop? And if you said, well, I, I, I hadn't thought about that. Well, I'd say, well, you go think about it. And when you come back with somebody with a name, and the two of you agree that this is what, then, then, I, then, then we're in the game. But we're not in the game if you're the dead end street. It, it, I, I don't equip anybody to not equip someone else. And so the reproduction comes in that mindset that I am being developed so that I grow, but I'm responsible then to develop someone else. That makes sense? We created our vision, which is to become the best mortgage banking company in America. Tell us the importance of enrolling, John, people in a vision and why it's so important. Well, you know, first of all, people do what people see. So the reason vision works is it's visual. Uh, leadership is visual. Uh, when people follow a leader, it's because they see that leader. When uh, culture is established in a company it's 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 not a comp it's not established by the words that you say it's it's by the actions that you do it's so visual really works in fact stanford research says 89 percent of everything you and i know we learned it visually first 10 percent audio one percent through the other senses so establishing a vision is just absolutely essential for the success of a company however in the leadership world that I live, what I try to help people understand, especially when you're talking about Pat starting something, building something up. In the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I have the law of buy-in. And the law of buy-in just simply says people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And so when uh, leaders come up to me, Pat, and they'll say something like, boy, John, I've got this great vision of something I would really like to build this company I'd like to start. What, what do you think? What do you think? Do you think, um, do you think the people will, will gravitate to the vision? And I always stop them and I say, well, let me ask you the question. Have the people bought into you as a leader? You, you see, if they've bought into you as a leader, they'll, they're going to buy into the vision. If they haven't bought into you as a leader, they're, they're really not going to buy the vision. So when, when people talk about vision, they talk about putting some kind of a preferred picture of the future out in front of the eyes of people for them to see that would motivate them. And I say, no, that comes second. There, there's, there are two visions you've got to cast for your people. And the first vision isn't anything about what you want your company to be. The first vision is who you are. And, and if you are the right person, 
uh, then they're ready to sit down and, and they're ready to enlarge their mind about the vision that you may have for them. But if they haven't really bought into you, then they're not going to buy in the vision. So whenever I talk about vision casting, I, I say there's a difference between a vision caster and a vision carrier. Um, uh, when they buy into me, they buy into me because I carry that vision. In other words, when they see John Maxwell, when they see Pat Flood, they see the vision. They already see it. Now, there is a vision. There is a preferred picture out there for that future. But they see you. They, they see me. So I always say, that, you know, it's, it's you that you sell before it's the vision that you sell. And a lot of leaders, they, 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 they miss it there. They just think, if I have a great vision, people will follow it. Well, they may like the vision, but if they don't like you, they're not going to follow you to it. So let, let's, let's fix, let's, let's get ourselves uh, in a sense in a state of credibility uh, because we have a way of making that vision uh, talk to people every day and become uh, personal every day and become achievable every day if they see it in us. If they don't see it in us, it's just not going to sell. My mission is to leave other people because that's what coaches do better than I find them. Yes, I um, like yeah, so they're both inside out, set a little bit differently, but they, I think, get about to the same place. Do you create like goals every year personally, like family? Uh, and do you and the Maxwell organization create goals for the professional life that you have? Uh, I do. Um, first of all, my favorite week of the year is the last week of the year. And as uh, soon as Christmas is over, I began to get very excited uh, because the next seven days up to January 1, I don't travel. I, uh, I spend them with my calendar and uh, I, I, I look at, I, I do an evaluation of the year. And I literally go day by day, literally hour by hour. I, and, and, and I have a legal pad, I have four color pen and I just jot notes as I'm going through every day with observations and, and, and thoughts. And, and, um, and I, I, I spend probably about three days doing re reflection and, uh, and evaluation. And then I then begin to project, how am I going to apply that to next year? And I do this every year and it's, it's just a life changing exercise. I teach a lot of people how to do it. And, uh, it's just to me, um, you know, you really can't you really can't reach out to the future until you have realistically touched the past. And, and and I think that a lot of times we're always racing to something and and we haven't yet solidified the foundation we need that'll help us to get there. And so I uh, I use this last week every every year and and it's in several areas there's you know family stuff and there's business stuff, there's personal growth stuff that I want and one of the things I do is, is I, I note every time that Margaret and I had something fun that we did together. And then sometime during that week, uh, we'll go out to eat. And I'll say, are you ready? And, and I'll have three or four pages, legal pages. And I'll say, do you remember when we did this? And you remember, oh my gosh, remember what happened to us when we were here? And we just have a, a, a phenomenal evening reflecting on our year and laughing and sometimes crying. <laughs> Depends on what happened. But... But it's just experience. You know, we hear all the time, Pat, experience is the best teacher, but it's really not. It, it really isn't. If experience were the best teacher, as people get older, they get better. And I know a lot of people, they're getting older, but they're not getting better. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, see, so experience is not the best teacher. If it were, then people, as they got older, would become wiser. But evaluating experience. That's the best teacher. The ability for me to look what I have done and then and pull out of it um, life-changing principles. And so when my children grew up and my five grandchildren, I do this with them still today, is whenever we had an experience, which would be two or three times weekly of something, they knew after the experience, I was going to ask them two questions. What did you learn and what did you love? And, 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 and we, after a few years, they would just after the experience, okay, here, Dad, here's what I here's what I learned, here's here, here's what I love, and um, and I did the same with with my grandchildren. And what I was trying to do, Pat, is I was trying to teach them again 
to not just have an experience, but to have an experience that's unforgettable. Have an experience that has potential to uh, change my thoughts and, and, and my actions in my life. So anyway, uh, I, yeah, I, I every year evaluate. It, it's kind of like before I go forward, though, I have to make sure I settle the past and I'm comfortable with the past. And I've had during that evaluation many times where I come over on a certain date and I think, oh, it wasn't a good day. It wasn't a good day. And I've called people on the phone and say, you know, do, I, you probably don't remember <laughs> June, June 16th this year we were together. And, uh, you know, I think I was, I got sharp with you. I, I just, I need to ask you to forgive me. I just, and, and it's just, when I go into January the first of whatever year, I'm ready. I, I, I'm not like catching up after the first week has already taken off on me. On January the first, I am taking off with, with my goals and with my, my vision and, 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 and with the things that I'm now reaching forward to. But I, I think the miss is that so many times we are so anxious to reach forward that we really haven't studied and evaluated and reflected and thought on that foundation that we need to put under us in our past. Does that make sense? It makes all the sense in the world. The reason why people, I believe, are limiting themselves in the workplace, organizations and individuals is because their intention is to get something, a profit, to get the most they possibly can for themselves, as opposed to what all of those folks that I just mentioned who have really changed the world in their own way. Um, Horst and Hospitality and in, in the quick service, as they say, a Chick-fil-A business and UN Leadership, Marcy with Care for Kids, Supreme as a serial best workplaces. We're all focused on the simple but brilliant idea of giving away a blessing to other people in their lives as opposed to trying to get something. And then when you look at these folks that we're talking about with relatively average backgrounds um, and pedigree, they've all been over blessed in every single way in their life, awards and, and financially and everything else. So the harvest is just a natural following to those that understand the concept of sowing, which was just absolutely brilliantly described. Thank you for that. Pat, Pat I, was, I was having a lunch one day with Angela Arntz, who was the CEO for many years of Burberry, turned Burberry around. Then she went to Apple and she was number three with Apple. She was head of all retail and the highest, uh, highest paid executive in the world, female. I think her last year with Apple, she made $74 million. So she did good. So we're having lunch one day and, and I'm saying, Angela, what's the best advice you ever received? And she said, my father gave it to me when I was a child. He said, he sat me aside and he said, Angela, here's the way I want you to live your life. Give 60, take 40. Just do it every day. Just give 60, wow. take 40. Always give more than you receive. And she said, I was taught that as an eight-year-old girl. And I've grown up and I every day I give 60, take 40, give 60, take 40, give 60, take 40. I, 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 it's never I, 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 I give 40 and take 60. No, no, I, I give 60. I, I always make sure I give more than I receive. And then she smiled at the end of our conversation on that give 60, take 40. And she said, and by the way, John, I found out 40 is enough. It's just enough. And I thought how true that is. And I think that's the big miss again. We're always we're, we're always saying, boy, what's in it for me? What, what, what am I going to get? And what we don't realize is if you wait for someone else to bring you fulfillment, if you wait for someone else to bring you happiness, if you wait for somebody else to bring you significance and self-worth, you got a long wait. But the moment that you sow and realize that when I pour into your life and want more for you than from me, that I'm already doing something significant. And I'm already, now all of a sudden, I am the creator of my own joy. I'm the creator of my own inspiration as we were talking about a moment ago, because I'm giving and I'm in control of that. I'm sowing, I'm in control of that. The rest of it, it's automatic. When you travel the high road, first of all, you know, very few people travel. And by, by the way, it's a toll road. And so there's a price that you pay on it. But but 
When you travel the high road, you don't keep score. Um, I, I, you know, at 51, I had a heart attack. I, I remember I, I remember for about two hours, I had a heart attack getting it stopped. And, and uh, we were, in fact, we were at a Christmas party at, at, down at where the Braves used to play, what was called Turner Field. And, uh, our companies were there and I had a heart attack. I was, uh, in fact, it was late in the evening and we were about to finish the party and I was dancing with one of our people and she, and she said, John, your, your neck is wet and cold. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack lay down. So it's a long story. It ended up in Grady. You don't want to go to Grady if you have a heart attack. You, that's for gunshot wounds. And, you know, I mean, there's just, you know, and they didn't have a heart attack. But you do have a gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't forgotten at all, Patrick. You, you have not for, you, you've not, not forgotten. But I can remember for a couple, in fact, my children were there and, and, you know, I had five doctors around me after a while. They couldn't stop it. And, and he told my wife, I said, you can let the kids come in. And so we were, you know, we had a couple hours of, would I make it or not? I can tell you what I'll never forget about that experience is if they would have brought a phone in and said, you can call anybody. I, I wouldn't have anybody to call to say, wait a minute, I, I, can you forgive me? Mm -hmm. Now, please, we've got to make sure I keep this in context. I've done a lot of things that needed to be forgiven. So it, it's not like I've lived a perfect life, but I don't, I, I, you know, I tell people quit holding grudges, but hey, well, you know what? While you're holding that grudge and nursing it and having a pity poor me party, they're out dancing. And, and I, I look at people and say, do, do you not understand? So care, you know, I, I say, don't take, don't take baggage with you. Travel light, you know, and I've been, I, I've, I've, I've lost millions of dollars from people that didn't do the right thing, but it's all right. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm not going to carry that. I'm not, I, 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 have, I have people who I'm sure because I'm a leader and I've made decisions some people don't like. I'm sure I have people who don't like me, but I don't know who they are because I like everybody. This coming week, we'll all pause from our labors to celebrate my favorite holiday, Thanksgiving. It's a day filled with three of my favorite things, family, food, and football. However, that's not why I love Thanksgiving. I love this holiday because it's a day where all of us can take the time to sharpen and focus on one of the most powerful tools any of us have in life, gratitude. According to Harvard researchers, gratitude, Thanksgiving, it helps people feel more positive emotions in their life. It helps them relish good experiences, improve their health, helps them deal with adversity and it helps build strong relationships. The benefits of Thanksgiving, of gratitude, they're crystal clear. So why don't we operate from gratitude in Thanksgiving every single day? There's one single thing that holds us back, and that's resentment. All of us carry hurts and wounds in our lives. Some of those hurts and wounds, well, they were caused by events beyond our control. Some were caused by our own poor choices in life. And some were caused by the poor choices of others that ultimately came back to hurt us. The road to best, it's the high road. But as John Maxwell just shared, the high road is a toll road. What's the cost? It's free, but it's not cheap. The toll all of us must pay to drive on the high road is simply this, forgiveness. Forgive God for the events in your life beyond your control that hurt you. Forgive yourself for the poor choices that you made that hurt yourself and hurt others. And finally, forgive everyone in your life who has ever done you wrong. Once you pay the toll of forgiveness, you'll find yourself on the express lane of life, reaching your goals, getting better in your relationships, in your health, your finances, your faith, and your fun, and yes, in your business. That's the road that leads to best. Thank you, John, for all the wisdom you shared with us throughout this year. All the Supreme Leadership programs are available for you to watch at supremebest.com slash SLS. Best is waiting. Meet you there.